Hi, these are edited versions of the lectures that I taught synchronously over Zoom. I hope you find them useful. We are ready now to start lecture 18, our last lecture. And today we're going to cover two topics that are somewhat independent, but I could say they belong to the class of resampling methods, broadly defined. And they're going to be subsampling and randomization test. Okay. Uh, both, as I said, are unrelated to um, each other in a way. So, so far, um, and in particular last class, as I said, after we talk about the standard errors, we talk about the bootstrap and we talk about confidence sets, pivots, asymptotic pivots. Uh, we presented the bootstrap algorithm and then we discussed the properties of the bootstrap for the case of the sample mean. And we had some discussion in particular about the so-called refinements and why the bootstrap, um, you know, may be a better approach, even in cases in where you can do something else. Okay. So, uh, you know, if you want to make things very simple, uh, the bootstrap is often used in two types of situations. One is when it is not easy to get an estimator of the asymptotic variance. That is, it's not easy to get, use the asymptotic approximation to get a critical value. The bootstrap makes it mechanically uh, the same in a way, regardless of the problem. The other one is where you have other options available, but um, you decide to use a bootstrap because you have the hope that you may get a uh, better finite sample performance. Today, we're going to deviate um, or we're going to extend some of the ideas uh, that we're discussing the bootstrap and want to talk about subsampling. We're going to define what subsampling is. Uh, we're going to motivate it in a way, and then we're going to discuss uh, the pros and cons between subsampling and the bootstrap, which you're going to see, even though conceptually they are different. When it comes to the algorithm of how to implement subsampling in the bootstrap, there's only one change in one step. Okay. Remember that when we talk about the bootstrap, we're describing it in like four steps. Well, this is going to in, um, involve only one tiny change. And by that tiny change, we're going to affect all the properties. Then we're going to talk about randomization tests. Um, and in particular, randomization test is a family of tests that includes the so-called permutation test as a special case. And permutation tests are, um, you know, popular and often uh, misunderstood. So um, it's good, I think, that I'll have the opportunity at least to briefly talk about um, this somewhat. And as I said in other cases, um, these last two lectures in 480 are kind of like um, a bit more advanced when it comes to the concepts and sort of like introducing some of the things that you could see in some of the 481 sequence. And in particular, I cover uh, more stuff about uh, bootstrap subsampling and randomization tests in 481-3. All right. We're going to talk about subsampling. Um, the setting is going to be the same that we used for the bootstrap last class. There's going to be some data. Uh, it's going to be X. Um, it's going to be an ID sample uh, from uh, distribution P that is going to belong to some family of distributions, ball P. The parameter that we care about is some real value theta of P, okay, which, as I said last time, could be the mean, the median, or the regression coefficient in a regression. And we're going to have an estimator, theta hat. And of course, I'm not telling you right now what that estimator is, but you know, it's something that makes sense. Could be a sample mean, could be a least squares, IV, whatever it is that we're using in the context. That is theta hat for us. And the object that is going to be important for our discussion is the so-called root. And I'm using this letter Rn to denote the root. And as I, saw la as I said last time, the root um, is kind of like a test statistic, except that it depends on both the data, which is over here, and the unknown parameter. When we do testing, we typically replace the unknown parameter with some guess value, 0, 1, 3, and the root becomes a test statistic. We're going to use the notation, same notation we used last time, J and P going to denote the sampling distribution of the root. It's the distribution of the root. Rn has distribution Jn. And we're going to define the CDF by Jn xp. So the CDF is just the probability that Rn is less than or equal to um, a number x. And the notation should make it clear that this sampling distribution depends both on n, the sample size, 
and P, the distribution of the data that we do not know. The goal is to estimate this sampling distribution so we can make inference about theta. And for example, we'd like to estimate the quantiles of these distributions as we did last time, so we can construct confidence sets for theta P. But unfortunately, the main problem is that we do not know P. And if we do not know P, we do not know J, X, P, because of course this depends on P. So this is the problem. The bootstrap solved this problem by replacing the unknown P with an estimate that we call P hat. And we said, you know, it could be um, typically the empirical distribution of data, the distribution that put mass one over N on each observation, but it could also be some parametric bootstrap if you're dealing with a parametric model. Huh? By, um, you know, when people say the bootstrap without clarifying this, they're typically implicitly um, um, under the understanding that you're using the empirical distribution of the data. So, the booster was really nice, but it had a condition, okay? And the condition that you needed for the bootstrap to work was essentially, as I wrote here, that um, JNXP, when viewed as a function of P, was continuous, okay? Uh, at least some locally. And the idea was because we needed, if P hat was gonna be close to P, we wanted JNXP hat to be close to JNXP, okay? So, um, as I read, we wanted to guarantee that this guy was close um, to this guy if P was, had, was close to P. This is the notion of continuity that we needed. So an alternative to the bootstrap is known a subsampling was originally due to Politis and Joe Romano, and this alternative does not impose this requirement, but rather the following much weaker condition that says as follows. This assumption, there exists a limiting law, J, P, such that J and P converges weakly to J, P, as n goes to infinity. This is the only assumption that subsampling will require and he's saying, well, you have a root with a sampling distribution. You want that sampling distribution to have a well-defined uh, limit, and that's it. There's no requirement on any type of continuity and so on. And as I hint last class, or at least mentioned, but I said I'm not gonna prove it, um, this condition over here, the um, continuity condition, sometimes fails. And it fails in cases that in economics we care about. I mentioned some examples in I.O., said auctions, uh, games, um, and so on. Um, so having an alternative that doesn't require that condition is attractive, okay? Because, um, again, one thing that, it, you know, is key about subsampling is that it really works under very minimal conditions. This is very weak. You're just saying there's some limit law, and that's it, okay? So that's really the detraction the of subsampling. And, you know, of course, typically there's no free lunch. Uh, there are gonna be some costs that you're gonna pay for using something with um, uh, such weak assumptions. But um, anyway, one key thing about that I like about subsampling and, you know, is the, as a method, it just, it's just amazing that you can uh, derive something like this that, that works under such weak condition using arguments that are really simple, okay? So what I'm gonna give you now is some intuition that um, I know is sort of like uh, related to how, what got uh, Joe Romano inspired, which, you know, I had the pleasure to write some papers with Joe and, and he's uh, super smart. And, and so I think that um, I, one attractive feature is really how simple subsampling is and it shows cases how Sometimes you can solve difficult problems with using really, really simple ideas. So let me tell you that intuition. Suppose for the time being that theta is known, okay? That's simplification. I want to tell the story and build up. Of course, if theta was known, we didn't have a problem. But again, just suppose for a second that theta is known. And this is a way to think about. Suppose also that um, instead of having a sample of size n, we have a sample of size m, where m is n times k. So in other ways, we have k samples of size n. 
many, many samples of size n. This, this would be amazing. So this is an, an ideal situation. We know what we're trying to estimate and we have many, many samples of size n. So if this is the case, then we could estimate the sampling distribution of the root by looking at the empirical distribution of this object. What is this object? This is square root n, theta hat minus theta p, which is our root, but where theta hat is computed using each of these k samples, okay? We have k samples of size n, so we can use the first sample, we estimate theta hat, okay? And then we have square root n theta hat minus theta, then we use the second sample when j equals here two, and then we use another set of n observations to estimate theta hat, and then we keep going. How many of these roots can we estimate here? Well, k, because we have k samples of size n. And I wrote, this is an IID sequence of k random variables with distribution j, n, x, p, because we have k draws of this um, root r, n. So by glivanko cantelli theorem, we know that the empirical distribution is a good estimate of this j, n, x, p, if k is large. So if we have many, many samples of size n, we'll just compute the root for each sample, and the empirical distribution of these roots is giving us a good estimator of what we want. That's great. Actually, you can do even better. You can show, which I'm not gonna do, but you have to believe me, you can show that we can do better by using all possible sets of data size n from the m observations. Here, I use sets of consecutive observations. The first n observations, then I use the second set of n observations, the third set. Well, here I'm saying, what if you just use all possible m choose n subsets of observations of size n? Well, that's a lot. And then you can do better by just um, using all these observations. Okay? So that is sort of like the idea of what's behind subsampling. If we were in a situation in which we knew theta p, and if we were in a situation in which we had all these samples of size n, then the problem would be solved. Hopefully this is clear. Now, in reality, of course, you know, we don't have m many samples of size n. We have only one sample of size n, okay? So even if we knew theta p, and I'm gonna stick to this, let's assume that theta p is known, this idea that I just explained won't work. Okay, because we just have one sample. But the idea says the following. We could replace n with some smaller number b, okay, that is much smaller than n. And if we apply the same intuition that we described before, what we could do is we could use these samples of size b. And, you know, if we have uh, for each samples of size b, we can compute this root, the square root b, the estimator that uses b observations minus theta p. How many samples of size b we have? Well, we have n choose b, okay? And so here theta hat b is the estimate of theta p computed using the j set of data of size b from the original n observations. And you would expect, you know, that this will deliver a good estimator of j b x b. So notice how here there's a b. So we're estimating the sampling distribution of size b. But we're interested in the sampling distribution of size n, not the sampling distribution of size b. So we need to argue somehow that this distribution of size n and the distribution of size b are sort of like close to one another. That is, if we can estimate the distribution of size b, then we can say that that's sort of like useful to say something about the distribution of size n. How do we do this? Well, the only assumption that we need is that Jn converges in distribution to some J, which is the assumption that I wrote before. Because if you have that, then at least if both N and B are large, you can argue that this Jn and Jb are close to each other because by the triangle inequality, you have this inequality over here. And then this first term will go to zero if B goes to infinity and the second term is going to go to zero is n, if n goes to infinity. So now we learn that if we knew theta p, okay, 
And if we apply that intuition that we described before, we can take subsamples of size B, where B is a smaller number. Suppose that your original sample is a thousand, you can take subsamples of size 80. And so then you're gonna estimate the distribution, the sampling distribution of size 80. And then you're gonna argue that as long as 80 and a thousand are large, then these are gonna be close to each other by a simple application of the triangle inequality as here. So that's the, how we're building up the intuition of subsampling. We, we still have to deal with one thing, which is we're assuming that theta p is known. Okay, but hopefully this is clear. Now, the intuition that we need both b and n choose b to be large, okay, for this argument to work. Because remember, here we need b to be large. And to get apply here the Glevin Cantelli theorem, we need this to be large. So n choose b needs to be large. And so one way to get both is to assume that b goes to infinity and b over n goes to zero, which are the usual conditions that you will see for subsampling. And once you have that, I said the procedure is still not feasible because in practice, we typically do not know theta p, okay? But we can replace theta p with a full sample estimate of theta hat n, okay? Provided that, you know, um, that this object over here is small, which it is because square root b times this difference, you know, you can multiply and divide by square root n, and then, you know, you have this is big op1, and this bar over here goes to zero. So this goes to zero. So um, how is this useful? Because if you just write a square root B, theta hat BJ minus theta hat N, which is the root that you can compute, right? The one that has theta hat N instead of theta P. Well, as I said, a uh, useful trick is always to add and subtract. So let's add and subtract theta p. And so this second term is the one that we had at the top. So this root and this root are asymptotically the same. And for all this argument to work, all we require was that Jn, the sampling distribution, conversion distribution to some limiting distribution J. Remember, the bootstrap required this, and the fact that this sampling distribution was continuous in a certain sense, okay? And the problem is, as I said last time, showing continuity of this sampling distribution is first problem specific, Okay, for every problem you're dealing with, you will have to think about this. Second, it's typically hard to show. Okay, so sometimes people will use the bootstrap out of faith because it's unknown whether the conditions that you need for the bootstrap to work hold or not. Whereas for subsampling, as I said, the requirement is really minimal. You're just saying that whatever you're using has a limiting distribution. Um, so um, that's great. On the flip side, we now have a tuning parameter which we didn't have for the bootstrap, which is this B. And it will turns out that, you know, B is not easy to choose in practice, okay? So that's gonna be sort of like the downside of subsampling. But providing you have a good choice of B, subsampling works under minimal conditions. Do you have any questions about the description of uh, subsampling and the intuition behind before we move forward to properties? All right, so then subsampling is what we just described. Let's move to the main theorem. Main theorem says the following. Assume assumption A, also let JNP, the sampling distribution of tau theta hat minus theta P. Notice here, uh, small change, I didn't use square root n, I just used tau, because I want to accommodate other estimators. For example, the non-parametric estimators we discussed in 
um, the middle of this class, which did not converge as quarter rent. They had some other rate of conversions, n h and h to the power something. So it doesn't matter what the rate is. There's some rate for some normalized in sequence here tau, right? Think about as quarter rent if that's simple. Then n capital n n is just going to be this n choose b, and we're going to assume that tau b over tau n goes to zero, b goes to infinity, b over n goes to zero. This uh, follows, you know, this follows immediately, for example, if tau is square root n, it just follows from this, okay? So most often this follows from this, so, but here for completeness, we state it separately. And then there are three parts. It says, if x is a continuity point of the limited distribution j, then ln b x converges to j x b in probability, where ln b is the empirical distribution of tau b theta hat b minus theta hat n. This is the um, quote unquote um, approximation of the root that we can use. That was in the previous slide. So this is the empirical distribution of this guy. The empirical distribution of this guy converges to the limiting distribution of um, the root that we want. If this limiting distribution is continuous, then the convergence uh, holds uniformly, okay? over x. Um, and then finally, if we denote by C and B the uh, quantile, one minus alpha quantile of this empirical distribution, and we denote by C alpha P the quantile of the limiting distribution, then um, provided this limiting distribution is continuous at its quantile, the probability that the root Okay, now this is the full sample root, the one that we care about, is less than or equal than the subsampling quantile converges to one minus alpha. So this third part is about subsampling critical values are, whoops, are what you want. And at the end of the day is the part of the theorem that, that we claim Every time we use subsampling to do inference, you're just going to have a test statistic. This could be on this side, some I say a T statistic. You're going to get your subsampling critical value from the algorithm that I'm going to describe in the next slide, but basically applying subsampling. And so this is going to give you a valid critical value for the construction of confidence sets. So I'm not going to prove this theorem. This theorem is, of course, in the original paper and the book subsampling by Politis and Romano, and, and the book by Lemma and Romano. It uses used statistics, so the, the proof is actually clean and elegant, but I don't have the tools uh, here to, um, or I mean, I haven't covered the tools that you need to follow the proof, okay? So that's why I'm not even um, going to try to do it. So when it comes to implementing subsampling, um, there's only one place that you need to make a change relative to the algorithm for the bootstrap. So I wrote here, except for the first step, implementing the bootstrap and subsampling requires exactly the same algorithm. In the case of the bootstrap, if you recall what we did last time, we said condition on the data, we draw B samples of size N from the original observations with replacement, okay? Each observation had probability one over N, and we denoted the chase sample by this star. And it had important thing is the word replacement here and um, size n. We have B samples and a sample of size n. Whereas with subsampling, we're going to have n n samples, which is again, both are choices. So n n and B are the same of size B from the regional observations without replacement. So every time you draw an observation, you don't draw it again. So remember that in the bootstrap, we said when we I'll show you the marbles, we had two green marbles, but then seven bootstrap samples had like four or five green marbles because you could obtain the same observation multiple times in a bootstrap sample. Whereas in subsampling, observations are not repeated. When you draw an observation, you don't draw it again for a given sample. The second change is that your sample is called a subsample because it's smaller. It's not of size N, it's of size B. Now, leaving aside this change, all the other steps are exactly the same as in the um, bootstrap algorithm. So um, 
funny how you like little a little change like this can affect things so drastically in terms of like under what condition things will work and also some other properties that I'm going to discuss in a minute. So in practice, this number n choose m, okay, tends to be really large. So what we do is instead of computing all possible n choose b, sorry, n choose b subsamples, you just take a random uh, number b. So at the end of the day, most often you don't have n, n here, you just have b as in the bootstrap, where b is the number you choose, as I said, a thousand, high thousand, so on. Okay. And that's because, again, if n is a thousand, for example, and, and I said b is 80, and if you just choose a thousand, choose 80, you'll see that that number is huge. Okay. So um, you don't need to compute all of them, you just took a thousand of them at random. But you have to be careful when you code this thing, if you were to code it, to make sure that you're sampling without replacement and then you're taking subsamples that are smaller. Other than this, same algorithm, same thing, bootstrap and subsampling. Comments. The bootstrap, I said there are examples where, you know, the convergence um, happens, but there's no continuity in P. And I said those are the cases where the bootstrap fails. And I wrote here one example is extreme order statistic. Remember I told you last time for um, if X was uniform zero theta, and so theta hat maximum likelihood was the maximum of all the observations. That was a case, uh, probably the easiest case to show that the bootstrap may fail. Um, subsampling has no problems handling these cases. In general, like all these cases where the bootstrap typically fails, you can show that subsampling will work. Okay. Um, and I said, but if if I stop there, you may say like, well, then why bother for um, uh, why bother to think about the bootstrap when you have this thing that looks a lot more robust? We can just use subsampling. Well, there are two reasons, and one is that typically when both the bootstrap and subsampling are valid, the bootstrap works better in the sense of a high order asymptotic refinement um, that I told you before, and so you have this trade off where subsampling is more generally valid. But if the bootstrap works, the bootstrap will work better, okay? Because it may provide a refinement, where subsampling, you know, uh, will never give you a refinement. But um, the other thing is that to implement the bootstrap, you essentially have no tuning parameters. Just go with the bootstrap, and then the only thing you have to choose is, choose is B, but, you know, B could be large, so it doesn't matter. So there are no choice. Whereas for subsampling, you have to choose B. And choosing B is not easy. There are some rule, rules out there that you can find about how to choose B, but it turns out that it's not easy to um, pick sometimes. And then results may actually change when you change this value of B. So you just, as I said, you have a sample of size 1,000. You set B equal to 80. You get some numbers. You say, oh, I want to see how robust these things are. So you now just B, choose B equal to 100. And then your numbers may change uh, a lot. Okay, and so now, you know, it becomes an issue to choose uh, B. Um, and so that's still an open question. Um, having said that, there's a variant of the bootstrap that is known as the M out of N bootstrap. Okay, and here um, um, you see uh, this qualifier at the beginning. Instead of taking samples of size N, you take samples of size M here, where M is much smaller than N. So, um, and then essentially the M out of M bootstrap and subsampling are essentially the same. This M out of M bootstrap came after subsampling, so you can uh, think that it was just a response to uh, the ideas that subsampling brought in. But, you know, the fact that you hear the word bootstrap in a method doesn't mean that you can have an asymptotic refinement because, for example, the M out of N bootstrap is essentially subsampling. And it has a tuning parameter. Now here is M, which is the same as B. Just um, I'm saying M out of N bootstrap because literally these are the two letters that are used in the literature you'll see in papers and books. Uh, you don't see B out of N bootstrap. It's called M out of N bootstrap. Um, but um, it is essentially subsampling. As I wrote here, um, there, you know, you can show this because essentially this requires m squared over n going to zero. Okay, and then the only difference between the m out of m bootstrap 
and subsampling, assuming that B and M, for example, are the same, is that one samples with replacement, the other one samples without replacement. Okay, and then when that's the game, you can show that the probability of having ties, you know, is, is not an issue. And I actually included that in the lecture notes, okay, but I'm not going to do it here. But if you're just curious to see, like, okay, does it matter to sample with or without replacement? And you'll see that the argument is uh, not very difficult, but it involves counting, counting. Okay. So that's about it about subsampling. That's all I have to say. Um, are there any questions about subsampling? Now we're ready to talk about randomization tests. So let me start with the motivation, and then I want to explain what's going on. Um, for some of you, the way to think about randomization tests deviates um, so much from other things that we do that sometimes uh, is confusing. When in reality, the idea behind randomization tests is just so, so simple, okay? But it's just, it's so simple that it's sometimes confusing, um, as funny as it sounds. So let me start with this uh, motivating example about the so-called sign changes. Suppose that you have a sample of size 10, okay? So I wrote here X. Notice the notation, X is my entire sample <coughs> of size 10. And um, as I said, where X here is just a scalar, takes values in the real line, and has a finite mean that I'm gonna denote by theta. Um, the main thing that I'm gonna be using right now is that this distribution of X is symmetric about theta. The normal is symmetric about the mean, okay? The uniform is symmetric about the mean, and actually there are a lot of distributions that are symmetric uh, about their mean. So this is something that we're gonna exploit. Notice that I'm saying 10. Why, why am I using 10 instead of N? Because I want to make it very explicit that I do not want to do asymptotics, that I just want to make finite sample valid inference with whatever number of observations we have. And I'm here exaggerating by saying we only have 10 observations, okay? So ball P is gonna be the collection of all distributions that satisfy these conditions, that they have mean, theta, and then they are symmetric around theta. What we want to do is to test a hypothesis about the mean, uh, for example, that the mean is zero versus the alternative that is not zero. So n here is 10. So using an asymptotic approximation doesn't seem like the right way to go if you feel that you're dealing with a small sample size. And I wrote, at the same time, this is more general than the normal location model, so we cannot exploit normality. We cannot say, oh, you know, let's just assume that it's a normal with known mean or variance or whatever. So um, what's the hope? Well, suppose for a second that we decide to use the sample mean, okay, to test this hypothesis about the mean. So I'm gonna call it X bar 10, which is X bar N always. Well, we have 10 observations and our test statistic is just gonna be the absolute value of the mean, so T, which I'm gonna use now for our test statistic, is the absolute value of the sample mean, is your T statistic that you typically use, except that it's not standardized. So um, intuitively, we know what we want, right? So if the sample mean is far from zero, right, we want to reject. If the sample mean is close to zero, we don't want to reject this hypothesis. The only question is what's big, what's small, okay? What is big? And so I wrote, the question is how do we compute a critical value that delivers a valid test, okay? Uh, when we do not want to take n to infinity. And the answer is that we can do this by exploiting this symmetry condition in this example, this stuff that the, that the distribution is symmetric around theta. So how can we exploit this? So let epsilon i take values that are either one or negative one. These are called sometimes um, rather macro random variables. If you take draws, if, if you don't, it's just a sign change random variable. It either keeps the sign of something or changes the sign of the fact, the stuff that you're multiplying um, by. So note that the distribution of x is symmetric about zero under the null hypothesis, because this is the distribution symmetric around theta, and under the null hypothesis, theta is equal to zero. So now consider transformation G, 
which includes this vector of epsilons, okay, in R10, and define the following. We're going to define a mapping from x to gx, where you just multiply each of the x's by one of these epsilons, okay? So epsilon 1 times x1, epsilon 2 times x2, and epsilon 10 times x10, okay? We're going to a bit know by uh, ball g, the collection of all these transformations. How many do we have? Well, m, which is 2 to the power 10. There are 2 to the power 10 elements g. Because, you know, you have each coordinate can take only the value 1 or negative 1. You have 10, so it's 2 to the power 10. What's important is that the random variable x and gx have the same distribution under the null hypothesis. If something is symmetric around zero and you just change the sign, okay, well, that's going to have the same distribution. Think easily about a normal. Uh, if x is normal, zero, one, uh, then the distribution of negative x is also normal, zero, one. Nothing changes. Okay, and so we're going to try to exploit this. And what, I wrote, what this means is that we can get, quote unquote, new samples from P by simply applying G to X. So we only have this sample of size N, but now I can take one element G and multiply G times X, and I'm gonna get a new quote unquote sample. It's gonna be this one, epsilon one times X one, epsilon two times X two. That new object also has distribution P. So now how many samples can I get by doing this reshuffling? Well, I can get two to the 10 new samples. And this is a thousand new samples, okay, from this sample of size 10. And then we can use these samples to simulate the distribution of the test statistic, because now I can, for each of these 1,024 samples, I can compute the test statistic, you know, one by one. And this will give us a distribution of the test statistic will give us a critical value, and it turns out that this approach will give us inference that is valid in finite samples. Okay? This is the idea. So, of course, this is an example. So, the question is, what, what's, what's the general framework behind, behind this? And so, we're going to go over that. Let me define the general framework. Data here is going to be x with some distribution p, and it's going to take values in some sample space that I'm going to denote by calligraphic um, p. This is very important. Note, p is now the distribution of the entire sample. This is a deviation from the notation that I've been using so far because, you know, we are having with IID data, and so I always says like xi has distribution p, and we have an IID data, so each x has distribution p, whereas here I'm just saying p is the joint distribution of what you observe, okay? Since we're not going to be doing asymptotics, it doesn't really matter. This com this notation is uh, more convenient. So we want to test the null hypothesis that uh, P belongs to some subset, P0, versus um, some alternative. And we're going to know by G, define a group of transformations that map X into itself. You know, the sign changes that I showed you in the previous slide was an example. Here we're being more generic. It's just we're saying is a group of transformations, okay? And we're gonna make the following assumption, and this is the key assumption for randomization tests to work, and it's called the randomization hypothesis. It says, under the null hypothesis, the distribution of X is invariant under the group of transformations in G, under the transformations in G, sorry. That is, for every little g in bold G, G of X and X have the same distribution whenever you are under the null. That is, g of x and x have the same distribution, provided x is a null, uh, coming from a null distribution. The important thing is note this condition that we have over here does not require the alternative hypothesis to remain invariant under g, okay? Only the null hypothesis is assumed to be invariant. Um, a note I said over here, um, this is a mathematical group, you know, it's not um, uh, an informal term. So a group has properties, has an identity transformation, an inverse transformation, and so on. 
So um, not that it's going to matter too much what I'm going to say today. I just want to clarify that the use group here is not just an inform in an informal sense. It's a mathematical notion of a group. So if you map to the example that we set before, G was a group of sign changes. Okay, and we show that, or at least saw clearly that um, X and G of X had the same distribution whenever X had mean zero, right? Like if X had mean like four, it is not true that, you know, X and negative X have the same distribution because one will have mean four, for example, the other one will have mean negative four. So it's not true that under the alternative, uh, these random variables are invariant to these manipulations. The requirement, is that these random variables are invariant under these manipulations whenever you are under the null hypothesis, and that's it. So now that this is the general setting, I'm going to describe the test. And the test is going to look like um, coming out of space from you because just, as I said, it's just going to look so different from all the things that we do. But um, if you manage to just think conceptually, you're going to, uh, see that it's actually conceptually very clear. Plus, in the next slide, I'm going to describe the test, mix in the conceptual definition of the test and the actual implementation of the test, uh, both in sort of like one slide. Uh, but uh, hopefully, I'll be able to clarify uh, the separate the two aspects. So let T be the T statistic, any test statistic, actually. And this is going to be an important feature, like the properties of randomization tests do not depend on the test statistic you use. For testing the null. And we're going to denote the cardinality of this group bold G by M. So there are M elements in this group bold G. Okay. Now fix your X to some little X. What we're going to do is to sort the values of the test statistic. Okay. These are order statistics from smallest to largest. Okay. And these are the order values of T of G of X as G varies over bold of G. So you apply one of these g to the x and you compute the test statistic. You apply another g to the to x and then you compute the test statistic and you keep doing the, um, how many elements do we have? M. So you're going to have M test statistics. And now you sort them from the smallest to largest. T1 is the smallest. Tm is the largest. Then we're going to do a test with nominal level alpha, as always. So using this alpha, we're going to de uh, define this uh, value k, and k is going to determine our quantile, okay? It's just going to be, forget about the bracketing, okay, which deals with discrete things, just this 1 minus alpha times m. So you're saying, in the list of m objects that I want, give me the 1 minus alpha quantile, and that is going to determine this tk that I put here in orange. That's going to be the quantile of our test. So I could tell you like, that's the quantile, just use the test. But it turns out that randomization test for the properties that I want to describe in the next slide, the theory is done with the so-called randomized test, which is something that I briefly mentioned in lecture number three. And now I want to use it for the first time. And in order to describe the randomized version of the test, I need two additional objects. These objects are the functions that I'm calling here or numbers m plus and m zero. What's m plus? Look, it's just the number of elements in this list that are strictly above tk. So if we just come here, you know, this is going to be m plus. The numbers that are strictly greater. Uh, how many elements are strictly greater than tk? That's what we're doing. It's an indicator. Just tell me how many elements are greater than TK. And what is M0? Which is how many elements are exactly equal to TK? Because, you know, there could be ties. So M plus, how many elements are strictly greater than your quantile? M0 is how many elements are exactly equal to your quantile. How much repetition do we have? Of course, M0, in some cases, it's just going to be one because there's no repetition. There's only one element there equal to TK, and that's totally fine. It's always at least one, right? Because we have one element. And then this M plus, in principle, could even be zero, right? Because if the quantile is the maximum in the list, which may happen if, like, 
M is really small, uh, that's possible as well. Other than that, it's just two counts. Then we're going to define uh, a number A, which is strictly in between 0 and 1, as follows. A is going to be M alpha minus this M plus divided by the M zero. And the randomized randomization test then takes this form. It rejects whenever your test statistic is above the critical value. So it's one whenever T is above TK. It doesn't reject whenever your test statistic is strictly below your critical value. So it's zero whenever T is less than TK. And it rejects with probability A when your test statistic is exactly equal to the critical value. Okay, so this thing that we have in the middle, whoops. Makes it that this is a randomized test. And apologies for that's the way, you know, labels are. The fact that the test is randomized has nothing to do with the fact that we're using a randomization test. I know that they use words, but you know, there could be other tests that are randomized that are not randomization tests. And you know, we are going to have versions of randomization tests, one in the next slide, uh, that are not randomized. Okay. So I know that could be confusing, but this is what it is. And this is the test. Okay. This is the test. So how do you, again, stare at this slide and tell me how you would compute this test? Well, you have the data and you have this group of transformations, okay, where, for example, are the sign changes. Well, take all these elements for this bold G, apply to your data, okay, and then for each transformation, you're going to compute your test statistic. How many test statistics are you going to have in your computer? M. Give me the one minus alpha quantile and define your test like this, okay? And you are good to go. This is your test statistic, this is your critical value. Hofding, and this was a 1952 paper, okay, shows that this construction gives you a test that is exactly level alpha in finite samples, and that this is true for any choice of test statistic. So the result is really powerful. This test is, as I said, possibly randomized, um, if we have ties, okay, which may happen, as I said, if M is small. Uh, randomized tests, I said this is important, are useful for theoretical purposes, but not so useful for empirical practice. If you're a practitioner, you don't want to use a randomized test because it means that at some point your test may reject, you know, due to like a flip, flipping a coin, with probability A in our case, and then you will not like to go to, you know, a talk and say like, oh, Look, today I reject, uh, but tomorrow, you know, I just rerun my code and I happen to not to reject, okay? And so every time you give a talk, sometimes you reject, sometimes you don't reject because you're rejecting based on flipping a coin. So people will never use a randomized test. So you may say, okay, why are we talking about randomized tests? Because randomized tests have, um, are useful for theory. However, in practice, as I said, one may prefer not to randomize, of course, and so, we can use the non-randomized version of the randomized test that rejects whenever T is greater than TK, okay? And here, an, an R means non-randomized, and so the non-randomized version of the uh, randomization test looks like this. Reject whenever your test statistic is greater than the critical value, which in other words is the same as going back and setting A to zero. Okay. It may be conservative, meaning it may, if you want to reject under the null with 5% probability, sometimes may reject less than that, say 4% or whatever, depending on the setting, but um, it's just going to be valid. Okay. Because it's going to have size that is less than or equal than alpha. So hopefully you understood this. And to me, this is the beauty, which is in the next slide, we're going to have the formal result that says that randomization tests are valid in finite samples. And this result, which, as I said, gives you finite sample validity for any choice of test statistic, okay, is something that um, you can prove in one line.
So let me just read the theorem. We're going to prove it because, as I said, it's one line. Why wouldn't you do it? It's a beautiful one line. Okay, so theorem. Suppose that X has distribution P, and the problem is to test that null hypothesis B belongs to ball P naught. Let G be a finite group of transformations of X into itself, onto itself. Uh, suppose the randomization hypothesis holds. Given a test statistic T, let phi be the randomization test as described above. Then 5x is similar alpha level test. Boom. The expected value of v phi of x is equal to alpha for all p in the null hypothesis. Okay. I use this word here, similar, which I haven't discussed in this class, but it means that this rejection probability equals alpha for any distribution in the null. It's not, you know, sometimes you have tests that are equal to alpha for the worst. Uh, distribution in the null, but not for all the ones in the null. So um, sort of like a concept that is beyond this class, you can ignore it, uh, but that's the property. The important thing is that this is equal to alpha for any distribution in the null, and this is for all n. So I wrote here, remark the randomization test not only is of level alpha for all n, but it's also similar, meaning that this rejection probability is never below alpha for any distribution in the null. That's a theorem. Okay. So we're going to uh, prove it now. Here, for convenience, I rewrote the test. Okay. Remember, the test rejects when you're above the critical value, it doesn't reject when you're below, but if you're equal to the test statistic, you'll reject with probability A, where A is this expression that involves these objects over here. And as I said, the proof is really one line, so um, we should do it. So I'm gonna say for every X, we're gonna fix this X now. You can write the sum across little g in bold g of the test apply that gx, okay? What is this? Well, this test is just going to be 1 when t is above tk. So, and how often is t going to be um, above tk is m plus times one. In addition, this test is going to be equal to A when T is equal to TK. And how often that happens is M zero of X. And the third term is that this test is going to be zero whenever the other inequality happens, but zero times that is just going to be zero. Now, this is equal to m alpha by definition of a of x. So, m of alpha and I'm going to go back now to the beginning, which is here, is equal to the expected value under P of this sum. And now I'm going to view X as a random variable, right? So I write capital X. So M alpha equals the expected value of that thing based on the first line that we wrote. And so now this expectation is linear, so I can write this as the sum of G or ball G of the expected value G of X. Uh, 
And now comes the magic step, which is the randomization hypothesis. The randomization hypothesis says that the distribution of G of X and the distribution of X are the same. So that means that the expected value of phi of G of X is the same as the expected value of phi of X. Okay, we're here, I'm gonna say, by randomization hypothesis. Okay, so I'm just saying X and G of X have the same distribution. So these expectations are the same. But note that now we're summing over G, but nothing depends on G here. It's just the specty value of phi of X. So this is M times the specty value of this. So, since you have M on both sides, you can cancel this and this, and then you conclude that alpha equals expected value of V of X. And then we prove the result. It took us two lines because the iPad is not wide enough. On the board, it would have taken us one line. See, beautiful construction. Any questions about the proof on the construction of randomization tests? All right, so now that we know the general construction, um, what I want to do in the last few slides is to show you how this applies to the particular case that is called a permutation test. Why? Because permutation tests are popular, people use them, and I want to discuss about you know, okay, how we can apply the previous result that we just derived to the permutation test, why is the permutation permutation test useful and when it is valid in finite samples and when it is not, okay? And hopefully that uh, will be clear and that's gonna conclude today's class. So as I wrote here, a special case of the so-called randomization test is the permutation test. And in economics is, um, you know, these guys are popular. So let me just do this through an example. And um, this is a two sample problem. Suppose that, we have a sample y1 to ym of ID observations from some distribution that I'm denoting here by py. And then independent of those, we have z1 to zn, which are ID observations from the distribution pz. Right now, this looks like a statistic problem. It has nothing to do with economics. I'll show you how this map to economics in a couple of slides. But for now, we need to understand the basics. We have two samples that are not pair, okay? So Z1 and Y1, they even have different samples. So notice that these do not correspond to the same units. They're just two different um, uh, samples. As I said, in the notation of the randomization test, X is the uh, entire sample. So here, what's the entire sample? The entire sample is all the Ys and all the Zs, okay? It has size um, M plus, the entire observations. What we want to test is that the distribution of Y is the same as the distribution of Z versus the alternative that they are different. And so we're gonna consider the following group of transformations. We're gonna let capital N be M plus N, which is the total sample size that we have. And so for a vector of size N, which is the dimension of our data, we're gonna let G of X, okay, our transformation be this one that permutes the observations of X. So it's a reshuffling. If we just have this vector and you could like shake it, that's what you're doing. You just take, you know, elements in a new, uh, you know, arbitrary order given by this thing, pi. So here pi 
1 through n is so-called a permutation of 1 through n. And bol g is going to be the collection of all those permutations. How many do we have? Well, n factorial. But you can see here that if the distribution of y and the distribution of z are the same, then x and g of x have the same distribution under the null. Because if the distribution of y and the distribution of z are the same, then x is just a vector of n iid random variables. Right? And if they have the same distribution, you have n iid random variables. And if the variables are iid, then the order in which you list the variables doesn't matter. The joint distribution is just the product of these marginals. And the product doesn't, you know, the order for the product doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter if you have which one you put first, which one you put second, and so on. Um, so now we have that um, this uh, property that we call the randomization hypothesis, which requires that x and g of x have the same distribution under the null, happens in this context for this group of transformations, which C is not sign changes that we used before. It's a different group. It's a group of permutations. But the construction and the idea is exactly the same. It belongs to the family of randomization tests, just the bulgy is something different. So how do you use it? Well, so I wrote here, in essence, each transformation G produces a new data set GX. This is sort of like what uh, I said before. The first M elements are used as the Y sample, and the remaining N elements are used as the C sample to compute your test statistic. If a test statistic is chosen that is invariant under permutations with it, each of the Y's and each of the Z sample, like, you know, one example will be the difference in means. You compute the difference of Y, and then you subtract the difference of Z, then you don't need to consider N factorial permutations. It is enough to consider N choose M permutations, okay, obtaining by taking the first M observations from all N as the Y and the remaining as the Z. That is, when you look at n factorial, you're accounting from, for example, suppose that, let, to, ma to make it clear, let's suppose that m is 10 and um, n is 6, right? So flipping the order of the first 10 observations doesn't accomplish anything if you're going to take an average of the first 10 observations. The order doesn't matter. So all those transformations that just reshuffle what we're calling the Y observations don't really matter. The only transformations that matter are those transformations that flip variables that are called the Ys to the place that are called the Zs, okay? So any transformation that take one of these 10 observations to the spot of the last six observations. And so there are uh, N choose M of such transformations. And this is equivalent to a subgroup G prime of G, okay? Now, in practice, sometimes people just, you know, um, ignore this depending on the setting, but it is important to conceptually understand uh, what transformations are actually introducing variation and what transformations are just giving you the same test statistic over and over. Of course, this depends on the test statistic that you're using, okay? So, um, that's... Um, that's what matters. Now, the important thing that I'm going to come back in a minute is that the randomization hypothesis here holds whenever the distribution of Y is the same as the distribution of Z. And as I said, I want to discuss this in a second, but just keep this in the back of your mind. Now, let's think about um, the... Um, permutation tests in the context of treatment effects, which is a context that we, uh, we're we gonna see in practice in papers, you know? So here the data is a random sample of outcomes and treatment assignments. So we have Y1, D1, Y2, D2, Yn, Dn, say from a randomized control trial, just to make it simple, okay? And then the observed Y is the usual uh, um, Y given potential outcomes that we've been using in this class, okay? So since we're in the context of the randomized control trial, D here, which is the treatment assignment, is exogenous, okay? You're just flipping a coin for individuals. Suppose that we're interested in testing the hypothesis 
that the distribution of the potential outcome y0 is the same as the distribution of the potential outcome y1. So if it just, you know, I'm running q0 and q1 for these distributions, then all hypothesis then would then be that q0 is equal to q1. Well, then under this null hypothesis here that I'm calling five, it follows that the distribution of this vector, which is the original uh, one, and the one where you permute the treatment assignment indicator, is the same for any permutation pi of n. So notice how here the permutation is not apply, of course, to all the elements, it's applied only to the vector d. And so what does it mean? It means like random assignment was exogenously assigned to individuals. So whether you got a D1 or a D0 shouldn't uh, affect the joint distribution of this, provided that um, this null distribution holds, okay? So a permutation test that permutes individuals from treatment to control or from control to treatment delivers a test that is valid in finite samples by the same construction and theorem that we wrote before, because the randomization hypothesis, I'm gonna write here randomization hypothesis, holds for this null and this group G. And then the result that we described follows. Researchers are often interested in the hypothesis or hypothesis about the average treatment effect, right? And we discussed this um, before. What would that be in our notation in the previous slide? It would be the hypothesis of the expected value of y1 equals the expected value of y0, okay? This is saying the average treatment effects is zero. So I wrote here, one may still consider permutation tests that permutes the vector of treatment assignment, exactly what I wrote in the previous slide. But unfortunately, such an approach does not lead to a valid test and may over reject in finite samples. Not only, you know, um, it doesn't have any finite sample validity. So I've seen uh, this statement, meaning, oh, I wanna use permutation tests because they're valid in finite samples, and then researchers will apply that to a hypothesis about the average treatment effect. Well, that's not true, okay? Because for the argument here to follow, I wrote, we need the randomization hypothesis to hold for the null hypothesis that we choose and the group G. And this satisfies that, you know, this thing that we said if this is X, right? We have the G of X has the same distribution of X under this null hypothesis. Because suppose now that the means are the same, the average treatment effect is zero, which is the null hypothesis, but the variances are different, so the, the other moments are different, then it is not true that permuting is gonna keep the distribution of these two objects the same. In order for the permutations to keep the distribution invariant under the null, it has to be that the entire distribution are the same under the null. Okay, you cannot just claim this by making a statement about the means. So if you care about the average treatment effect and then you go on every, uh, and you go, uh, use a permutation test, you cannot say that you're um, having a test that has finite sample performance or better or finite sample validity because this is not true. If you're using a permutation test and you're hoping to have finite sample validity, then you need to be clear that you are thinking about a hypothesis like the one over here, which is the distribution of potential outcomes are the same. Now, you know, you may still decide to use a permutation test to test this hypothesis. And so, as I said, you're not gonna have finite sample validity, but it turns out that these tests are gonna be asymptotically valid, okay, if you use the right test statistic, which is not something that I wanna discuss, but going back to the question I got earlier today you know, about test statistics, whether you're standardizing or not, for example, permutation tests are gonna be asymptotically valid if you're using a test statistic that is properly studentized. And if you're using test statistics that are not properly studentized, then the permutation tests are not gonna even be asymptotically valid. 
And a popular example of that is difference in means. If you just do in the example that we had before, y bar minus z bar, and that's your test statistics, say the absolute value of that. And then you just want to test about the mean of y being equal to the mean of z. That permuting and use permutations and that test statistic are not going to lead to something that is going to be valid asymptotically. They're not going to be valid in finite sample. They're not going to be valid asymptotically. Okay. So when you go into asymptotic properties of permutations, randomization tests, the choice of test statistic matters a lot. Whereas when you're thinking about finite sample properties, the choice of test statistic is irrelevant. Okay. And I wrote here, this distinction between the null hypothesis in five and that in six and their implications on the properties of permutation tests are often ignored in applied research. And hopefully these things are changing over time because there's more people that are highlighting these things. But um, I, would, I would argue it's still um, you know, poorly understood most of the time. Um, randomization tests, uh, so I'd often dismiss in applied research, okay, due to the belief that the randomization hypothesis is too strong to hold in real empirical applications, okay? So people will say like, well, you know, this is beautiful, the construction is nice, but at the end of the day, I don't have a setting where X and G of X have the same distribution because I don't care about null hypothesis about, say, the distribution. I care about this type of null hypothesis that are not enough to give me the randomization hypothesis, okay? I wrote here, however, Randomization test may be asymptotically valid even when P is not symmetric, okay? And then, for example, in a paper I wrote with Federico Bugni and Simchik, we show this in the context of randomized control experiments and permutation tests. Whoops. What is this? There we go. And then also, there are, I call, also recent development on approximate randomization tests. Um, and this type of constructions do not require the randomization hypothesis to hold in a given finite sample, they require the randomization hypothesis to hold asymptotically in the limit. And this turns out to be quite useful to do inference with cluster data when you have a small number of clusters. And we worked that out in a paper with uh, Sam Sheikh and Joel Romano. So um, that's that. And this is all I have to say about um, permutation tests and randomization tests. And this is the end. So, so I wrote here, thank you for not forcing me to talk to a black screen every week. I appreciate your faces in front of me. I hope that you had some fun uh, in this class. And um, I hope that this year that I'm gonna keep these videos for future generations, uh, you know, future generations of students find um, this material uh, useful for review and, and, and the like. But for now, I'm gonna just um, gonna move to answer questions that you may have. Yeah.